Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Guard Insights. Thanks, sponsors, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, ComC.com, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Hugs and Scott Auctions, Tops, Panini, and Upper Deck. I was on with uh, Mike Moynihan. He asked me, I, I like the home and home. I'd be on somebody else's show, and they can be on my show. And each show is a different character. Mike is solidly vintage. He's golden age of cardboard. So I get to put my vintage hat on, uh, although we talk about a bunch of things. And this particular episode, again, he gets to decide. If it's my show, I get to ask the questions or maybe do dueling questions. But if he's the host, then he gets to do the asking the questions. I'm like, obviously get a word in edgewise sometimes, but always good time with Mike and talking about the hobby, probably more from a vintage perspective, which is my first love, but it's not my only love. And this particular outtake, some of the time we talked about going to shows locally and around, he has a different perspective. I go to a show, I'm really disappointed if there aren't some good dollar boxes there. He goes to a show, he's going to be disappointed if there aren't some good range of vintage opportunities for shopping there. He's a astute shopper. He knows what he wants and very tuned into his uh, particular part of the market and what he collects has good focus. And uh, we also talked about the Cleveland National, what's going on there. I haven't been there for a while. I hit all the Cleveland shows many years ago when I was living in Bowling Green and a great collecting base just in the state, in the area. Cleveland National, if you haven't been there, it's going to be very different from Chicago, but it, it could be terrific in its own right. It's got its own character. Here it is, my discussion with Mike answering his questions and going back and forth. So thanks, Mike, and thanks, listeners. It's interesting times in the hobby. I think people that are disappointed had expectations. They have their own script and things don't work according to form that they've predicted. And so if you just enjoy which I think you're doing and I'm doing, you can't lose. Some things go up, some things go down, but through it all, I'm still enjoying going to shows and interacting with collectors. Where we are in the hobby, is anything different? First of all, it's not an opinion about the past. We were there for a lot of it. I was there for a lot of it. There's a factual record, a pictorial record of what the story was if you go back so many decades. What nobody knows and where there really are opinions are what's going to happen this next year and going forth. And really, everybody's entitled to an opinion. We can have an, a somewhat educated opinion based on what's happened in the past. But if you rely too much on, oh, that can't happen because it's never happened before, you got to be careful how you evaluate the past because sometimes the past is a prelude to some new thought, new approach. I think more collectors are shifting. It's a period of transition for a lot of collectors right now, trying to decide which direction they want to go in the hobby, what they don't realize because they don't have the experience is that they're going to do that eight more times in the next decade or 20 years, right? No, historically, Mike, I think there wasn't as much shifting if you go back through the decades because there was a steady onward, cards either stayed the same or went up slightly each year. There was a lot more predictability. You didn't know that at the time. But right. for the most part, people had their quests and they just would buy stuff and add to their collection, complete their sets and all that. But over the last few years when it's up and down and a lot of ups, but now some downs, all bets are off. And so people are moving from one category to another because they're looking for the next good thing or the next thing to hit. I don't think that was done that much 30 years ago. It was like That's a good you point. just collected what you collected and you're on a quest. Now people are jumping around from quest to quest to be opportunistic that, hey, this is up, this is very expensive now, or the price has gone down. Now, what am I going to do? Maybe I'll switch to shot soccer, or a lot of people are moving to vintage baseball, but some people can move from vintage baseball to modern baseball. There, there are no rules anymore, and the hobby's a lot broader than it used to be. There are a lot more options, just like young people. There are way more options for the young person growing up now. Do you think because of the younger people getting in the hobby, and I see a bunch of them, and I'm happy about that, by the way. I, I think it's a good thing for the long-term health of the hobby. And maybe we were this way. The attention spans are so much smaller. I'm looking at it as a 50-year-old, I think, differently now than I did then. And I don't remember how I thought back then, other than I wanted every Daryl Strawberry card I could get my hands on. I was a player collector. Like you said, yeah, I had a quest. And I didn't buy a whole lot outside of that. I bought occasional things, but I was on a mission. That was my hobby. That was my passion. You had Daryl, but you also had Juan Gonzalez. Yeah. And then you had Josh Hamilton. Hamilton. They're all sluggers. 
They all had a following and they all had a little bit of a fall of a, not a crash, but yeah, you know, I get Daryl Strawberry, I think is doing better now, but he had some dark days. Josh Hamilton had some dark days and Juan Gonzalez, I think really has never gotten the respect that he deserves. I've been curious about what people think about card shows and do they think it's going to continue to morph into something different? Do they think the card show market is still strong? What say you about just card shows in general? I put myself in Kyle Robertson's shoes, being the promoter here in Dallas, the show I go to the most. And it's tough to stay on top. He's got six shows every couple of months and they're well done. But is each show that much different than the one before? Now, this show coming up, he's got a bunch more Rangers, and he'll trade on that, and, and that'll be great for the people that are interested in that. But it's not an autograph show. It's really a card show. The sponsors aren't that much different than the ones before. The trade nights, all the elements are in place. If you go to Disney World, how many times a year do you want to go to Disney World? Well, there's different lands there. There's Epcot and all these other kinds of things. But they're going to be an occasional show out of the six where one is not going to do as well as the one before it. And that might be a trend of one, or it might be the market saying that we're more interested in high school football and college football in the fall than we are going to a card show. I'm hoping every show will be good. And the other concern I have is that somebody's going to come in and say, Dallas is such a great area. In the off months that, that Kyle doesn't do, we're going to put in a show and get some of that. I don't want saturation. I want a, a presence for the industry. I want visibility for the industry. It's 10xing the hobby for fanatics. Is you, you don't want it overbaked. You, you want it to grow and to be a positive experience. But Kyle can't keep having record attendance each time. It, sure. But the, even the, the worst one I've been to was still a great show, but people are comparing. Oh, it's down 10% since last time. I don't know that it was even. I love your Disneyland analogy because when you think about it, the Magic Mountain or whatever ride that's featured it never changes. You can go this year, next year, or the year after, whatever. The, the ride's essentially the same. And that's true of a show experience. I like having a show I can go to every couple of months and make my own decision personally about whether or not I want to attend for whatever reason. It's nice to have a presence locally where you can do that. There are plenty of people around the country that don't have any shows. As much as we think shows have just exploded across the country, there's still plenty of areas that don't have anything. So we're at least blessed to have that. Maybe I don't go to six like I would have a few years ago. Maybe I go to three this year instead of six. But that's still a lot of shows. And I don't think Kyle or Rob and Burbank need to pizzazz it up. The attraction is the cards itself and the ability to have a card show. To me, that's what you do. I don't need a lot of bells and whistles and flair with my card show. Yeah, but uh, Rob Veris, my good friend there, his challenge is he's covering the late summer and the winter, but somebody's liable to come into Anaheim or Ontario or Burbank, one of those areas, and say, you know what? There's nothing stopping me from doing the fall and the spring. And marketing and advertising and promoting in all the same places, maybe I don't have as many dealers as Rob has, but it's still an opportunity for people to get their fix. Then who knows? Then it dilutes or maybe saturates the area. I, I just think brand ought to be important, Mike. It is important in most industries. And Kyle has a brand. Rob has a, a brand. TriStar has a brand. And they say if it's a TriStar show or TriStar is going to be there or whoever's standing behind it, if Kyle is standing behind it, then he's got a track record. Sure. And he's working it hard. And somebody coming in at the last minute just because there's an opening there, I don't think people should stay away, but brand ought to be important. I know what I'm going to get when I go to the Waters Creek. Yeah, he's earned it, too. Speaking of shows, I've had a lot of people over the last three months or so, especially it's ramped up quite a bit as we head into 2024, start asking me about Cleveland because the last Cleveland show was 18. So... A lot of people are new to the hobby. I didn't even know they did nationals in Cleveland. It's like this way back in the day in Cleveland. It wasn't that long ago, but long ago enough hobby timeline that there are plenty of new people in the hobby. So I'm getting a lot of, hey, tell me about Cleveland. What are your recollections of the last few Cleveland shows that you would pass on to people? It's an outlier venue because it's not like any of uh, the building is different. The location is different. The proximity or lack thereof to the hotels is different, but it's still always been a good show. I, 
Uh, I'm just on the record as saying I think it'll be not as good as Chicago last year through no fault of Cleveland's. Now, I'm, I hope I'm wrong, but there are going to be less dealers there. It's a smaller footprint. Now, that maybe that'll add to some enthusiasm, but I think people came out of the woodwork for the Chicago show. Even yeah. with all the extra square footage and extra tables and booths, it was crowded in every area of the building. And I think Cleveland will be equally crowded, but it's a smaller place and less dealers. Now, maybe that means the dealers will do 10% better because there's 10% less dealers there. That's a less silver lining, less competition. Mm-hmm. I will be there. But Chicago is so convenient. It's so hard to beat. It checks all the boxes. And Cleveland is closer to the East Coast. So you're going to get some people driving there, slightly different crowd. It'll be a great show. Yeah, I've been to Cleveland in 14 and 18, the last two times I've had it there. I loved Cleveland in terms of the show venue itself. You can't walk from the hotel. There's some logistical things you've got to be concerned about. You, You can't walk across the street to a restaurant for lunch. You're captive there. That's true. I hadn't thought about the food thing, but that makes a great point. You, There is nowhere to go eat around the IX Center. So you better come packing snacks this year. The, the or, outer perimeter, one side of it's got all those food court kind of things. They're not sure. exotic. And there's a bunch of tables there. So I've sat down with people and had impromptu burger or whatever they've got. It's been fun. Yeah. When you walk in the main door, the left side of all the yeah. tables all and all that. Line. I remember what sticks out to me, memories from Cleveland, is the wide aisles, plenty of room to walk around. It's a good show floor. When they, and now we won't have the Ferris wheel anymore, right? I think they took that out. I, I predict the, the aisles will be not as wide. I think what John Brogy's team did, uh, showed last year that Joe Drellick, I think, noted with interest is that putting in more tables is good. Yeah. Uh, the previous Clevelands were not crammed. There was plenty of room there, but there was extra room. There was a walk-up area. I think they're going to cram a lot more booths in there. Most the hotels have shuttles to the IX Center from the lobby. You got to wait on one or whatever. You no, know, it's on the half hour. The IX Center, where the Cleveland show is, was going to be mothballed. It was either going to be right. destroyed or commissioned. They were out of business. It was not cash flowing or some problem with it. My hope is they're bringing it back with intentionality and purpose We're going to take out the Ferris wheel. We're going to uh, refurbish it a little bit. The National is probably the brand of the hobby, if you were to say, man, they built this over. It is, but Cleveland, playing to your strength, is a little bit of a vintage brand. The 